Hello, everyone. If you are just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be Political Solidarity in the US. I'd like to welcome Darren Sands to the virtual stage to begin our session. Hey guys, can you all hear me? Good to be with you tonight. Um, thank you for the invite to have this uh, discussion tonight about political solidarity. I'm happy to um, obviously be here. Um, we've got a, a, a you know an interesting night in America at, um, as ever these days, and um, a couple of our guests are not with us yet. Um, we have uh, on us, with on the line actually, Jonathan Herzog, who is running for Congress in New York. And I wanna give him a uh, opportunity to uh, introduce himself. Well, thank you, Darren. And thank you to everyone for hosting and joining this conference today. Uh, happy Juneteenth. We all just came from a, a Juneteenth Jubilee up in, up in Harlem. And um, it's a critical moment, as, as Darren said, we're in amidst crises on top of crises on top of crises. And the topics that we'll be discussing on political solidarity um, are more important than, than ever. Um, by, by quick way of, of background, I'm a civil rights organizer and legal advocate running for Congress in New York's 10th congressional district, which is the entire west side of Manhattan and South Brooklyn. It covers Wall Street, the world's financial capital, uh, but it's also where one in six people live in poverty. It's kind of ground zero for the winner take all economy, for the concentration of market power, and for all the extreme polarity that we're seeing in our systems today. So it's really great to be here and appreciate um, you hosting this, Darren. Yeah, let's just get in, right into a conversation. What, what, tell us what your district is like and segue that into what you did today. Absolutely. So again, this is the 10th district. So it's the west side of Manhattan from about Columbia University all the way down south uh, covering Wall Street. And it was also gerrymandered to cover parts of South Brooklyn. Um, it has uh, the country's largest LGBTQ community. Um, so it covers uh, Hell's Kitchen and Greenwich Village and West Village and the like. Um, and again, it's one of the most educated and liberal um, and actually well-off districts um, where most folks work in some type of financial services or, or professional services, but it is highly, highly unequal. So if you walk around parts of the Upper West Side, what you'll see on one, on one side of the street is um, underfunded public housing. On the other is vacant luxury housing developments. And this is really the fundamental dynamic that is the core and center point of this conference, of this era of stagnation, this era of income inequality, of Ponzi scheme level inequality. And you see that right here on the ground in the streets where amidst this pandemic in particular, up to 40% of parts of the district have fled. So those who can, those who have capital um, have been able to flee while one in five of the dead, more than one in five of the 120,000 that have died um, are New Yorkers. So this is, again, some of the dynamics um, at play in this district um, where it is the most unequal and just rife with um, these, these types of tensions in that way. How, how did that factor into what you wanted to do today? Can you describe your day? Yeah, well, so today we went to the um, Juneteenth um, Jubilee uh, because this is a critical moment uh, amidst a crisis in police brutality, um, a crisis in a calling for criminal justice reform. Um, and it's incumbent on all of us to stand up and call out and not settle for the type of lip service and inaction and uh, just empty rhetoric that has filled the halls of Congress and of our legislature for, for so long. 
So it has to fundamentally change. And it starts with um, our voices being heard on the streets, loud and clear, that we need justice, we need it now, and uh, we don't have time for, for anything else. Did anything strike you today that you saw in the streets that you remember that will just stick with you on kind of a historic day? I think one thing I'll say, Darren, is just the joy, the love, the, um, the real sense of um, solidarity and possibility and uh, how much more work there is to do in a country, especially where um, not only do we have a crisis of criminal justice and policing, but black household net worth is one tenth that of white households and where people of color will be a majority by 2043. But black family net worth, the median is expected to be zero by 2053. Um, and this is in part um, why the centerpiece of um, this movement and this campaign is a call for a guaranteed minimum income, which is what Martin Luther King was fighting for um, in his final year before he was assassinated, a guaranteed minimum income um, for all, because the economic exploitation, the militarism, and the racism are so intrinsically intertwined, and we have to unravel um, them all. Let's talk about that, because you worked on Andrew Yang's campaign, and this has been one of the, I think, phenomenons of the political moment that we hadn't anticipated as political reporters, right, was like UBI. We saw you know, sort of the birth pangs of the movement, um, maybe in 2016. Um, and uh, how have you seen the evolution of it? And when did you start to see it as a politically viable um, thing that she wanted to be involved with? Or really, I don't wanna call it a thing, but a movement that she wanted to be involved with. Yeah, well, um, really, I think to your point, this has been such, incredible growth um, over the past number of years where when we started um, on the uh, presidential campaign, support for universal basic income for a guaranteed minimum income was in the low double digits. Um, and it was seen as this kind of far out futuristic idea that um, again, went back to the time of Martin Luther King. Um, but now upwards of 76% of Americans support a version of a guaranteed minimum income at least during this pandemic. And we saw the myth, the utter lie that we don't have the resources when for the second time in just a decade, the federal government gave a multi-trillion dollar bailout to the largest unaccountable multinational firms. Again, in the 2008 financial crisis and now. And we got crumbs, we got crumbs for the people. And this is the unsustainable, um, myth, this fundamental lie in American life today, that we don't have the resources. So it's been incredible to see the growth and the evolution. It's under the most tragic of circumstances and more and more people wake up every day to see it's not a them issue. This is an all of us issue. When more than 40 million are unemployed and more than 40% of those are permanently lost jobs. Um, so it's really been building from the bottom up um, and just coalition building where everyone from AOC now to Justin Amash um, supports a version or at least the idea of direct cash relief to people. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because when I would be on the road or I was at the National Action Network um, event, the, the national uh, convention in April of 2019 and Andrew Yang was a hit like he was like they liked him <laughs> obviously they liked what he had to say and I think one of the things about him is that he has a very straightforward sense of humor yeah <laughs> um, and he had an ability to connect with them from a um, in a really interesting way that I think reflected his understanding that as a non-white person in America, 
the responsibility to push social justice forward is shared. It's a shared responsibility. And as a New Yorker, even, I think that he had another awareness and it, it hits on some of the things that you're talking about in terms of running for New York 10, but I think that there's a certain awareness of as a New Yorker that we're in this together. And I think that's an intrinsic language that a lot of New Yorkers have, but it hasn't ever really been reflected in our political dialogue. And what you saw and I saw in Iowa with your campaign, with the, the, with the Yang campaign was a cross section of people who understood that we can build something together if we work together to make this happen. And I think that was the real magic of the UBI yeah. movement politically at that moment was that you imagined something that was just so needed in the sense yeah. that so a cross section of people were coming together regardless of race yeah. or gender or background. It was the funnest campaign to be around <laughs> by far. And really, honestly, maybe even, and you can talk about some of this in terms of how you're using social media for your own campaign, but I think that it was such a, an interesting um, portrait of America um, and an interesting in, uh, uh, issue to get behind. And I guess just as you reflect and you're running, obviously, for this congressional seat, how do you take what you learned from all of that experience and to what you're doing to campaign. Darren, I so appreciate this. Gosh, I'm getting chills listening to you because you got it. You saw it. <laughs> no, and like that's that's not something that you can take for granted. And um, and you just saw the humanity and the love and the fun and the sense that we can build something better. We don't have to settle. We don't have to settle for this false choice. Um, and. It was just that enthusiasm and that that joy of, I mean, everything in that movement, Darren, was built from zero to one, was built from scratch. I mean, like, I remember being out in, in Iowa and there were, we had five other folks on the team, but I was the only one on the ground there. And literally I would just drive three hours, go speak at a church or a union hall or a school or a local democratic meeting. Mm -hmm. It would be me, Pete Buttigieg, Eric Swalwell, Amy Klobuchar, the whole 26 folks, <laughs> you know, the, the entire entourage. <laughs> and we would just go and go and build and build and then just beat the drum. And to your point, I mean, a lot of it was non-traditional, <laughs> right? You know, long form, substantive podcasting um, and just um, really digital organizing. And it's it's interesting in this congressional moment, um, and I'm sure that, but Drew can also speak to this, how amidst this pandemic where everything is digital, everything is online, it is this um, hidden silver lining where coming out of a movement where you had to build everything with no institutional support, no media <laughs> support, um, you, you find new ways. And so for us, that might be on Instagram or on, on Twitter or in Reddit or in Facebook or, um, but, you find new creative ways to get the message out um, because it's such a critical um, message we have to hear. Yeah. How has how, it played into your own sense of how you want to run? I think the first principle has just been um, be yourself. And it sounds trite at this point, but in the world of politics, Darren, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it was it was crazy to see someone run and really be themselves. Um, and you get it from all sides, right? And so you can see um, the sets of incentives that there are. But I think that's the first principle is, you know, stick to your convictions about the ideas that matter and that are necessary in this moment. Mm. And just... Um, yeah, just, you know, really try to run authentically <laughs> yeah. um, in the sense that um, doing anything else um, just won't do. Mm -hmm. What do you think about Jerry Nadler in this moment? <laughs> well, we just had the first televised debate in the history of the 10th Congressional District. Uh, it's the first competitive primary uh, in the history right. of the district as well. Um, oh, that's actually saying something. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> And I think the reality is, um, you know, 
here's the fundamental contrast, the fundamental difference, right? Amidst this pandemic, 120,000 dead, Congress was, was on recess. Congress was on recess. And they came back to session to again, pass the CARES Act. And then uh, Jerry co-sponsored the HEROES Act to give a multi-trillion dollar bailout. The same, it's just not learning the fundamental lesson of the 2008 financial crisis. So to me, it's very simple. Do you bail out the banks or do you bail out the people? Do you put people first or do you put them last? And there's a lot more behind that and you know uh, pathways to that. But that to me is one of the clearest contrasts for what your priorities, your vision, and your record are. Mm -hmm. who, do you, who do you put first? Do we have Bajrun? Yeah, she's in. Hey. Hi, Hi Darren, how are you? I'm good. Hey, so I, no one told me that you were here. I actually was, I told Jonathan I'm running five minutes because I, I left my house at 7.30 in the morning. I just got back home. I just came from the meeting and I'm heading out again around 10 o'clock. We have somewhere to go in the Bronx. Okay. Last minute, you know. No worries. You're running for an important office, so. But I do have to say something to Jonathan. My brother told me today, he's like, I mean, we have a different name he calls me at home. He's like, do you know this Jonathan person? I'm like, why? He's like, you know, he was on a debate and he was <laughs> really good. And this is my brother. He's in Japan. And he's like, I'm like, you know, yes, I know him. He's like, do you know him personally? Because he doesn't like Nadler. I'm like, yeah, I do. He's very <laughs> into politics. So he's like, no, he did very well. And I thought he was in any kind of office. So I just have to tell you that I just had coffee. He made me coffee on the way and he made coffee for me. He's like, here, have this coffee and you go run there. And I said, yeah, I'm running late to the meeting. But I just have to say that it was a great debate. Rajun <laughs> Khan, introduce yourself. Tell the audience who you are. You're running for office in New York as well. Tell, tell, talk to our, um, our audience here. So my name is Padron Khan, and I'm yeah. running in Congressional District 14, which is um, uh, Bronx and Queens, and I am running against Ocasio-Cortez. So um, that's, and let me just tell you a quick about myself. I'm a financial controller for a nonprofit. I've been in the nonprofit industry maybe about 10 to 12 years, and I am married, two daughters. I grew up in the Lower East Side, Manhattan. And I've been in Sunnyside, which is the District 14, for almost 22, to 22 years. And I'm also on the community board. I'm in a lot of small boards here in Queens. Uh, I work with the community a lot. I was a former president of uh, a Bangladesh organization, which is uh, about 14,000 people were uh, residents of Queens and the Bronx. So I ran that, uh, that uh, organization for almost two and a half years. And I've been in the community for a long, long time, so pretty much I'm pretty well known around the neighborhood and in, in my community, I, I'm, I related to a lot of the mosques here and uh, in the Bronx, there's also another association, the Muslim Association, which is the Yemen. I, I actually talk to them, work with them. So I'm like a, a community person. <laughs> word, word, word. Um, what are you telling your daughters about this moment? I mean, um, you have an interesting perspective as a mom. Can you talk to us about that a little bit? I do. When I started the election, I have an 18 year old first year she went to college and I have a high school daughter. So um, I did tell him when I went to this election, I said, when I go into this election, you know, there's going to be a lot of things. People may make comments and uh, you may not like these comments. People may, may say certain things and they were very supportive and they said, we're fine because that's your decision. What do you want to do? And we sat as a family, we sat first with my parents included because sometimes what happened is people are very, uh, if you if you not with someone, they actually say things bad and you're public and if people curse you out too when I walk down the street sometimes or it happens. So they're both very supportive, especially my younger one. She's more like to the public life. Maybe she'll be something in the, in the future. My older daughter is very much a back end politician. She doesn't like her face being anywhere. Uh, she, yeah, she's like the more of a computer person, uh, checks my Twitter maybe every five minutes and she does all this, these other things. But what I feel like sometimes it's hard for them because I don't, I'm not home, uh, especially mm. the high school one is, it. but now with the pandemic, so they're all home. So sometimes it's good when I'm outside. So they give that breeze of air. They tell me it's like, mom, go out. We need some time, but it's been fun for them. We learn a lot. Uh, as a, a first-time candidate, I'm learning. And as my two daughters, who are very young, 
they're actually learning it. And it's quite interesting. They meet a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a minute, uh, real quick as, as an update. We've got about um, another 25 minutes or so. Okay. Um, so, Bajun, I'm so glad you were able to join us. I know you were out at an event. Our third uh, candidate tonight, um, Blair Walshingham, um, running in Tennessee's first uh, congressional district, um, had an event tonight. She couldn't uh, leave, but she really wanted to be with us. So that's why we've got two candidates and not three, um, in case you're wondering. Um, but she obviously um, sends her best and obviously, I think, given tonight's, um, just the significance of tonight, uh, it's appropriate. I think that any candidate would um, uh, have that priority. Um, uh, but Drew, can you, what are your, say, what are you saying to your daughters about the sort of racial justice moment in America? Well, for my daughters, they're very much into the Black Lives Matter. They've been to protests. Uh, they have, they go to a learning disability school who has emphasized of what's happening in the community. They had a couple of friends. They all wanted to go out, but I couldn't let them out because they were kind of young to go. Out. Like I said, if it's in the neighborhood, I'm okay with it. But if you're not in the neighborhood, being that I'm Muslim, so September 11, I'm just gonna go back a little bit. Um, this racism was something we actually had to face. So mm -hmm. like walking down the street. So we kind of know how most of people feel because we, I, you know, when people think about you're Muslim or you're a terrorist, you know, we already isolated that name with us ourselves. And from that side, so my daughters, like when we go to the mosque, when we go to like eat prayers, I'm sure you guys know the eat prayers are pretty big. We get mm -hmm. some people who actually condemn us or, you know, they, they say things underneath the breath. So what's happening and they understand fully, but they are in support of that. You know, it's time to change. It's time to make sure everybody's treated equally. And I have my, both of my daughters have a lot of friends who's um, part with the LGBTQ. Mm -hmm. So they really talk about a lot of things of that. Right on. Um, we have and a question. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, we also need to talk about education. Um, like in the Bronx, where it's a diverse community, mostly more Black Americans, more Latinos, um, I think the education system needs to be um, actually worked on because if you go into the school system, it's pretty bad. And we always get worried about how a student who's there, they don't get enough uh, education to come out of there and we want to build more. Uh, and if you also go down to Jamaica, I'm sure you guys, uh, you're all from Queens. If you go to rural area, like way all the way down Jamaica, the schools are not properly serving the minority community, I always feel like. All right. Um, there was a question that came in from the audience. And if you guys have questions, uh, feel free to drop them in. Um, one of the questions that came in, Badrun and Jonathan, we'll get back to you, is, um, is AOC too big of a national star to serve her district? Definitely. <laughs> she is. Why do you say that? Because I say that, I'll just tell you why, very honestly, because I've been walking. Look, when she was elected, a lot of people were happy because nobody was happy with the other congressmen. But then what happened is she, um, I mean, I don't want to say she's not in the, because I don't want to say what the other candidate keeps on saying. When I walk down Bronx, especially in the Bronx, I go to Penland Parkway and the, the thing is like, she's not there. And I think at these moments, sensitive moment time, people wanna see who, who they're elected and who's there, who's around them, helping them. And if you see other, there's a one person who's there all the time, one councilman, he's walking around, talking around. Some people don't even know her name. They're like, oh, we don't know who he is. It's like, maybe they do go to vote, but they're not, concern. And I think that's what the big concern is. I think she's very busy with the national politics with, with Bernie now with Biden. And I think District 14 is, is being a little pushed back. Like with the pandemic that happened in Elmhurst, um, I think as a congresswoman, I think she should have paid a little bit big of a role there because we had no masks. We had no uh, ventilators. We had people outside waiting lines for hours. And if you know Jackson Heights, Queens, Elmhurst and Queens, there's just one hospital there. So within the radius, everybody kept on going. If you had a heart attack, you kept on going there and people got sick 
and people stopped going. I, and when people would call me, I said, you know what, if you can, just go, don't go to the hospital, try to go to the city or go to Long Island because Elmer's was pretty full, like over full. And that's what I think that was the biggest, it was so sad because I lost family there. So I know how mm. it was. There was one doctor who had to see almost 400 patients. It was just impossible. Yeah. Jonathan, what did you see um, in terms of the stresses on the district that you're running for as it relates to the COVID-19 pandemic? It's tragically just a complete and utter collapse and failure of our economic consensus, our institutionals uh, framework, and the social fabric is fraying, where again, businesses are boarded up, um, parts of the district up to half of the community has fled um, but then you still have the one in six people who can't meet their basic needs who are living in poverty and living in crumbling public housing conditions so it is unfortunately the worst of all worlds and the the, the incumbent and the the entire fixture of um, of established politicians have done nothing, have done literally nothing. And it's, it's, it's devastating because they don't understand the scale and the scope of the crisis. Um, where the last time we entered a Great Depression, there was a one-to-one -one correlation between the rise in unemployment and Nazi seats in the Reichstag. The far left and far right populism of this moment um, emanated in part from the 2008 financial crisis and this age of impunity, this age of unaccountability where people's homes were, were foreclosed on um, and with disparate impact on communities of color uh, through, through redlining in particular. And then large, large firms and CEOs left with with, with bonuses amidst it all. So we're still reeling. We're still reeling from this age of impunity and we're liberal democracy, the, the foundation of it is being torn, um, torn to shreds. And there's nothing inevitable. There's no teleology. There's no, there's no natural order to any of this. Um, in fact, what you saw, Darren, is amidst this all, the, the entire New York State Democratic Party, the governor, the attorney general, the congressman, the board of elections commissioners, they canceled the primary. So we fought in weeks, for weeks in federal court. We fought for weeks to just restore the constitutional right to vote. And we won in the Southern District. We won in the, seven, in the Second Circuit just to restore the ability to vote. And this was after voting was made safe by mail. This was after, um, Vice President Biden warned that Trump might use COVID as pretense to try to postpone the election or avoid a debate. So I wish I had better news, but this is why we're running. This is why we have to step up because um, we need 21st century solutions to these, to these right. crises. Right. You talk solutions, to, and this is for the both of you and neither one of you can sort of go first on this, but like, Let's say you win and next year you get a call from Nancy Pelosi and it's, hey, you know, you've got a minute to give me your best ideas about how to fix the concentration of wealth problem in America. What are your three best sort of original ideas that you think about that you would want to propose to someone in power as a freshman member of Congress? So I think the first thing um, is a universal basic income, a guaranteed. Yeah, minimum. we know we know that, but I mean, like, <laughs> yeah. get get a little bit in the weeds on the policy stuff totally. that you've seen. You guys have been out there talking to yeah. voters. Like, I mean, maybe this is a better question for you, Jonathan. I don't know, but like, what what is your sense of how automation has actually hurt your district? And and you can go on your talking points if you want to, but I I feel like maybe you don't have to. So is actually very much in line with the founders of this conference. Vitalik and Glenn introduced me to the whole world of radical markets. And, um, and what I brought up in the debate was quadratic funding and common ownership self-assessed taxation. I think these two ideas are incredibly powerful. 
And um, what common ownership self-assessed taxation, which is what Vitalik and Glenn created in this new field of crypto economics, is take, for example, let's say this laptop or this microphone, right? Um, it's on continuous public auction, which is how we sell and license radio spectrum. It's how Facebook and Google sell digital ad space. It's how Uber and Lyft set their pricing. So you, Darren, mm -hmm. would say, well, this, this camera, this laptop, this microphone is worth $100. Great. So a common ownership self-assessed tax is like a wealth tax that works because you set the price and then the public sector, the government collects 7% of whatever value you say. So you're like, fine, but then don't I have an incentive to under report? You'll say, well, this camera is worth $10. Well, the, the, the incentive is it's on a continuous public auction. So if you say it's only worth $10, that means someone else can go purchase it at that rate that you set. But if you say, well, actually, I want to hoard it. This is the best camera. No one's ever had anything like it. And you set the value at $1,000, you pay the price. So we take 7% of that $1,000. And the power of this is, no more, is, is really no clearer than right here in the 10th. Because one of the biggest issues is vacant luxury housing developments. You have all this property, all this value, billions of dollars of value that just sits underutilized because it's more profitable to have buildings sit empty, have no, no one fill them, um, than to actually have the space being used. So with a common ownership self-assessed tax, you incentivize investment, you incentivize um, resources to be allocated. And then that combined with quadratic funding, which Vitalik has really led on, it's like matching funds, um, which just to quickly summarize, it's like the matching funds we're used to in New York City where if you run for city council or for mayor, you have a six to one matching fund for this crisis of public goods. So I think they've really brought these two radical innovative ideas to the table and that can flip the script on this era of inequality. But Drew, do you, do you agree with that sort of assessment in terms of a Ownership. idea assessment? Yeah. Well, the other thing I also want to talk about uh, that in, well, when my district, let me talk about my district, we need to invest in, in small businesses, which I talk about a lot. And uh, right now, the crisis with small businesses is happening. People are closing doors. People are not um, been able to open. And I think the funding, which I know Jonathan said something, the funding has not done gone well with all the small businesses. Everybody talks about groceries and restaurants. I'm talking about the hair salon, the barbershop, the dry cleaners, uh, the pet shops. And I think if I would have a chance to speak to her, I would say like, you know, we need to put grants in them, pull them out of the solution they're in and let them come out and let's start the business. Because with small businesses, you have so much red tape, like the taxes. By the time you get it up and running, you invest a lot of your money and then and if you don't have the funds to do it, three months later, you're, you're shut down. And also with the rental, uh, it, the rental is outrageous. And um, if you do a storefront in, in Jacksonville, for example, it's like four or $5,000 just to get a, a, a couple of less than a thousand square feet. So we need to build more because I think it produces job for immigrants who just came into the country. And that's something that because my parents were immigrants. So I know how they were able to help other immigrants when they came into the country, like to get a job. Because when you come in, people don't wanna hire you. You have, your English is a second language. You don't know the streets yet. So that helps a lot of people, which my, my district is a, it's very minority driven, just not one kind, many kinds. Right. Um, this is something that I was thinking about during, um, Andrew Yang's campaign. I don't know how much you were here for this, Bajun, but we talked a little bit about um, Jonathan's involvement with the, the Yang phenomenon broadly in American politics. And um, we talked to, you know, I brought up this question about th there seeming to be a, a really interesting cross section of people who were really interested in this stuff. And it was like, you know, um, working class black people in Detroit and like trucker, white truckers from wherever. And I just thought that that was a really interesting, the, the, the beginnings of an interesting coalition. And um, there's a question in the comments um, 
from someone who's not named, but I think it's a good question talking about the welfare stigma in America being sort of, I think traditionally, big, you know, thought of as a, um, a necessity of a black phenomenon that is somehow problematic with America and, and synonymous, I think, with just a broad, um, sy the broad systemic racism, racism that black people face in this country. But um, what, what do you have to say, Jonathan or, or Bajun, about the racial stigma of UBI and, and of, of welfare, I guess, in America? And how do you propose that UBI address um, that injustice? And just how do you think about the welfare stigma broadly? Well, I, I'll take this one just for when I heard about Andrew Yang, it was late July, I think it was on TV and we were talking about the universal basic income. So I have come. So the first thing when I heard of it, the first thing that I thought that it was like it would help domestic violence um, homes, because I worked with a lot of domestic violence homes that came in that people couldn't wasn't able to leave their home because they That's did not have yeah. yeah, because because they couldn't leave their home uh, because you know what? Finances became a big issue. I, I talked broadly about this. That is one reason that clicked when I saw him on television, like my all my family said, I was like, you know, he's a future president and being a South Asian and being from another side of the world, everybody's like, like they know there's someone else gonna be president. When Obama became president, it was something that uh, like it drove people to more po politics and policies. And when he was saying it, I'm like, you know, it's just a great thing for us being that he's from the other side or his family's from the other side of the world. So when that came up, we I had a conversation because about when I was the president, I had to deal with my at my organization. I had to deal with a lot of domestic violence home. Mm. All the cops, they will take the kids. But after two months, they would call me Ms. Khan. I need to, to bring my husband back. And I said, why would you go into a home that is so violent? They said, how am I supposed to survive? I, I can't get anything. I don't, I never did my taxes. I can't get a job. I have kids to support. I can't pay rent. So what happened is it's the means of no support. So that $1,000, $1,500, whatever we did, if we could get that as a permanent basic income, it would help people to stand on their feet. It would be a beginning for them to leave the home. And that was my biggest, like I, I drew to that one. And I, I, I was like everywhere talking about it. Um, so that's how I jumped in or just, I thought it would help the woman barrier that we have. It's not only in my community, it's a lot of communities. And that was a driven, like, is the best way. Even with single mom, single dad, some parents couldn't afford to go to work and pay for daycare. Because they actually made too much of that threshold, which I also believe daycare should be free, but that's another story we could get into. But the parents couldn't afford daycare. So if she worked, whatever she was working, she was putting into daycare. And that will be um, a lot of solution like that for families who are a single mom, single dad, or they have two or three kids that they can't afford. So that for me, that was a big jump to get into, okay, universal basic income, let me talk about it. And then when I have spoken to a lot of people, it people think about it and they're like, okay, so how do you pay for it? Because I don't want you to tax me. And I said, well, value added tax. So I give, I, I give them like, look, this purse you bought, you bought the purse for $1,500. It's a luxury good, I believe so. We put a little tax on it and then it goes back into to your pockets or the people who need it. So that was something I thought would be a great, it was a great idea. And I thought this is something that we could use in the community and where we're in district 14 right now, we desperately need it now, desperately. Mm -hmm. Don't say every two months they're gonna sit down and they're like, we're gonna do it every two months. We had the $1,200 that no, there's so many people that I could write down did not receive it yet. So if we had this permanent, it will at least help the families, the children, because if you're 18 and if you need your parents' taxes, you did not receive the $1,200. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, uh, you're saying basically like financial independence and empowerment is important for safety broadly. Oh, definitely. That's yeah. something when I leave somewhere, if they always say, if, you're, if your pocket is full, you'll be good. Mm -hmm. and that. that's what it is it's always a saying in my country i just said it in english they said if your pocket is full even if you have twenty dollars thirty dollars in your pocket 
that gives you some sort of some sort of energy is like, you know, I'm not going to fall on something that I don't have anything um, because the domestic violence that I faced, they didn't have a bank account. They didn't have, they had a social security, never worked. And they were relying right. on that threshold. Yeah. What about you, Jonathan? What do you say to the, the question of sort of the racial stigma that has been associated over the years of, with welfare? Is that something that you guys sought to tackle on the campaign? Is this something that you're thinking about now? Absolutely. And I think to me, that's why the framing of it as a dividend, as a freedom dividend, or as a data dividend yeah. is so essential. Because it's not a handout. It is not welfare. It's not from me to you, from you to me, from him to her. It is our resources. And I think Glenn actually offers a great example. When you go online, you go on Facebook, you go wherever, and you fill out those CAPTCHAs, you're like, what are these letters? What are these numbers? What are these images, right? To kind of log in, make sure you're not a bot. What you're doing is labor. You're doing work. You're actually helping train the AI, the machine learning to figure out, well, is this a motorcycle? Is this a tricycle? Is this a, you know, is this a traffic light? Is it something else? And that's actually uncompensated labor to the tune of trillions of dollars of value. You have Facebook, Amazon, Google, Netflix, Uber, et cetera. The top market cap um, firms in this country that are using all of this uncompensated labor, all the value we're generating from our data. And Yuval Harari put it really well last year. He said, whoever controls the algorithms is the government today. Yeah. And, we <laughs> and it's wild, but we haven't fully yeah. processed the fact that our data is being sold and resold to the tune of trillions of dollars of value. So it's not a handout, it's not welfare, it's not a wealth transfer, it's ours. It's our resources, the value we're creating. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I think it's something that this is only the birth pangs. This, I think at, the, at this point in the movement, I think in the data conversation, um, I think that black people, especially young black people in America are open to having that conversation. Um, it feels like the key to it is how you connect it to like actual ideas of what the justice moment can look like. And I think that, I think there's a lot of activists who would really be interested in having that conversation. I'm sure they're really smart people who are actually thinking about it too. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a whole algorithmic justice movement as well, right? Because yeah. the use of facial recognition has disparate impact and is racist and is used in the context of policing and by the data um, is unable to discern black faces um, more often than not. And so you're, you're right, this has so many ramifications and the kicker, the, the travesty is that our federal government is none the wiser. It's been asleep at the switch on all issues of technology now for nearly a quarter century when they defunded the Office of Technology Assessment. So Congress is literally flying blind. Yeah. What uh, do you have to say? say yeah, I want to follow up with, on that. Go ahead. With the with the welfare system, have you when you go on the welfare system when you go just individually, is it? I think also the way they are treated is also a, another. Like it's just so horrible. I just feel like because I did for the community, I had to actually take people who lost their jobs, and they had no other way out. But when you go in there, I think the people who are managing it, like literally kicks you in the stomach when you come out there, like, you know, you're taking the money. From the, no, it's just, I think it was created. So people who are in, like in bad situation could use that. And that's also, I think a big stigma. Oh, you're on welfare. So you don't work, you don't do this. I just felt like, because I have a lot of people who actually filled out tons of paperwork because they had no choice of, needing to go to welfare because they lost their job. They, they couldn't go back to work or they had some sort of issues. And that's, I, I, it's, it's just such a sad part uh, when I go in there and when you see the way they speak to you and knowing me, I was like, can you just speak to me normally? And I just, because I, I go as a translator or I go someone and I don't think it's a, something that people should be worried about. It's there for your help. And I think the people who manage it, I've been on several lines with people. And it's just, I see them, they're so embarrassed. 
And I don't think that should be. It's not an, it's, it's something that it's given that if you need it and if you provide the paperwork, you do get it. But I think the people who is like the city or the people who are working behind them, it's just, even when you go to Medicaid office, when you go to Medicaid office, I took an aunt of mine. I, I took her five times. Each time they told me you spilled out the wrong paperwork. And I said, sir, I have a picture. You gave me the same paperwork the same time. So she's an elderly woman. She did all her taxes. She's on Medicare, but she just can't afford the surgery she needs right now. So can you help us? And the fifth time he gave me the correct paper. Same thing when you go to the welfare and if you go online, I think the way they treat you make you very uh, emotionally, they hurt you, I feel like. And you wait hours online. I don't know if you ever dealt with that, Jonathan, but I have done a lot of community work. It's just so sad. And that's a stigmatism that I don't like. Like, don't don't think someone is going into welfare because they they did it because they just don't want to work. People do have really sad situations that they do have to get. And I I seen young kids. Yeah. There was someone who just traveled to to America right now, um, about four months ago. He said I came. Got about in thirty home. seconds on the clock. Oh, sorry, I did. I got four months You're ago. You're fine. He came Go in, ahead. He came into the country. He has no job. He can't eat. He's online getting food. Where does he go? Yeah. Yeah. Real quick, 30 seconds, not even 30 seconds, like five seconds, one sentence. What have you learned in this process? And, and what do you want to impart to the, uh, to the audience? Real quick. Oh, go ahead, Jonathan. You want to go quick? No, I just first in the wealthiest, most advanced society in the history of the world, no one should have to prove they are too poor to live. No one should have to prove they are too disabled to live. And it is an outrage that this is the system we're in. I just, have so much gratitude and thanks and love for this community that's being built from the bottom up because we need new alternatives, new institutions, new ideas, and new people leading the way. What about you, Bedrun? Real quick. Oh, uh, real quick. Uh, let's see. I have learned a lot in the last couple of months, but we need, need to acknowledge the inequality in our system, uh, the problem with income gaps. And I think when we all put ourselves together, I think we could come out and succeed in certain things we want. That's what I'm looking for. And I learned a lot and that's what I'm trying to see. How can we get equality in, in where I live and how can we get income equality all together? All right, well, thanks guys. Bajroon Khan, Jonathan Herzog, thanks for being with us. I'm Darren Sands. Good night guys, have a good one. Good night. Thank bye you, Darren. Bye-bye, thank, thank you, you all. <laughs>